Good morning, friends. It's Sandra Clay. I'm the pastor at Cook Shania Methodist Church. Welcome. Welcome to um, a chilly Wednesday. It's so good to see uh, all of you uh, as your name. Just a reminder, all your names don't pop up. Hey, there's Miss Julie. Uh, but all of your names don't pop up, so please don't ever feel like I'm ignoring you. Um, it may be that I just don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> and I don't always see all the names popping up. So there's Miss Edna, and we're so glad to see everybody. Charlene is on there. I'm going to tell them before you do, Miss Charlene. We have a big woohoo for uh, Charlene's family. Uh, Christopher was nominated for a Grammy. Uh, so the same uh, songwriter that brought you another in the fire uh, has been nominated for Hymn of Heaven. Oh, give it a listen, my friends. I can't tell you about this young man's faith. I don't have enough words, and I got a lot of them. But um, anyway, so congrats to Christopher uh, on that. He's always been an inspiration to me. Uh, remembering our good friends uh, Sally and Sarah um, who are recovering uh, after surgeries uh, and my guess is you've got tons of things going on in your life too some that cause you to celebrate like Christopher uh, and his family and some that oh require uh, kind of folks coming alongside one another it's kind of funny we're gonna be talking about that today uh, so just a reminder, if there's something we can be praying uh, about uh, with you and for you, uh, we'd love a chance to do that. Just kind of put it in the line right there. If you've got stuff going on that's a little more private, you're not ready to share it with a lot of folks, know that you can always find um, a connection to Cooks here through our website. You can go on there and leave a prayer request. You can... Um, uh, find us directly uh, and give us a call if you need be. So it is a beautiful day, Dwana. So good morning again to everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome. Okay, here we are making tracks through the book of Acts. Uh, who knew I was a poet? So uh, yesterday we began to talk about the boldness with which the apostles um, and when I use that word, I'm referring to those primarily right now, we're referring to those who were once Jesus's kind of inner circle of disciples. I don't want to use that like it's a hierarchy, um, but the general idea about apostleship is a direct lineage from those eyewitnesses to um the life, the death, resurrection, ministry of Jesus. And just um, FYI, when we get into the later parts of the book of Acts, there's going to be a lot of tension around that very title because Saul, who will become Paul after his conversion to um, belief in Christ, and service of Christ will call himself an apostle uh, because he met Jesus face to face, literally, on the road to Damascus. So here we are. We're going to travel through some of those parts of um, the Acts of the Apostles. So from uh, end of chapter 4, maybe beginning of chapter 5, uh, through nine is where we are today. So if you need to go back and make some notes, you can do that. Uh, yesterday, we talked about the boldness with which not only the apostles, but also disciples in general uh, were acting the kind of boldness that came when the Holy Spirit fell and filled them. I challenged us to think about uh, what's different today and why there seems to be an absence or at least a watering down of that boldness of spirit. I think it's important, church, for us to be thinking about that and deciding how we have been complicit in not allowing the full power of the spirit uh, to reign. But here we are, we've got this growing community. I mean, numbers, like most uh, church planters, 
would salivate over coming to belief in Jesus the Christ and being impacted, uh, filled by the Holy Spirit uh, every time the gospel message is spoken. And then there's this curious story in chapter 5 about Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife, who are a part of this community. We're told at the close of uh, chapter 4 about how a lot they held everything in common. Do you remember that verse that I, uh, that I read for you? Uh, chapter 4, verse 32, all believers were one in heart and mind. It goes on to talk about how many of them, because of their love for and investment, wholehearted investment in this new experience of community, were selling pieces of property or, or other things that they had and giving the sale price to the community so that widows and orphans and those who didn't have a way to care for themselves uh, that the body could care for them, that they would have the money to be able to do that and to support ministry. Um, and so we see people being the church, um, but in, um, uh, in a better way of being community than we live into today. That's my own thought. Ananias and Sapphira decide they're going to sell a piece of property, and uh, after they sell it, they decide together that they're going to hold back part of the sale price uh, and keep it for themselves. We need to be really, really clear now when we read this story, not to read anything into it. We've got to pay attention to the original context the kinds of mores and values and generalized practices that would have been a part of that. And we have to be very clear about these very things too. It was not required of them to sell property and then give every last penny to this experience of community. It wasn't required. This was their choice to do so. And then when they sold the property, holding back part of the price was their full right uh, in handling their own business. There, there weren't any expectations um, except in the understanding of what was happening. So as crazy as it sounds, this is how this story all plays out. Ananias and Sapphira... Uh, sell this piece of property. They decide to hold part of it back and give the bulk of it to the community. And in the giving of it, Peter says to Ananias, how have you let Satan become a part of this, this whole relationship, this ho whole faith life? How, how have you let the enemy become a part of this? And he fell over dead. Folks who loved and cared for him, they're, they're hauling him out and burying him before his wife even finds out. When she comes in three hours later, Peter asks a simple question of her. Is this, and there's no price named, but is this the price that you got for the land? A clue, my friends. A clue. Because here, Ananias and Sapphira were, Sapphira were content to allow others to believe that what they gave was a much more generous gift than the one that was given. Again, it's not about the dollar amount, but look at what Ananias and Sapphira were acting against. You ready? Um, this community was different in that it wasn't each man or woman for himself. They were committed to care for one another. And everybody had a different ability uh, to do so. This community was going to be different because their faith was different. Their faith was different because they knew Jesus Christ personally, if not in a physical relationship at least in a, this new spiritual dynamic. 
And because the community was going to be different, their behavior would be different. Here's Ananias and Sapphira still trying to work out the relationship between money and power, um, ego, the desire to be appreciated, to be thought well of, uh, to be considered generous, and then their own battle with whether or not they really are those things. And if Peter, the, the kind of the leader uh, upon this rock, I will build my church, at the leader at this time, if he had allowed behavior to happen when he is convicted internally by the gift of the Holy Spirit that something is off here, how long is it going to be before the community acts just like it always has? Do you see the importance now? There are so many questions that we are left with because of the death of Ananias, then the death of Sapphira, no communication between the two. I don't know. I don't know all the things, but I do believe that here at the beginning of a new community, we need to pay attention to what the Spirit was not going to allow and then consider what we are allowing today that is compromising who we are. It won't ever compromise whose we are, but the world certainly will not see this God who comes to us, who gives himself to us, including his own son, if we're just doing the things that are comfortable. Whew, it's gonna get deeper, y'all, you ready? So not only do we have all of this with Ananias and Sapphira, then the apostles uh, are arrested by the Sadducees. Now, let me, let's take a break for just a second and, and just name. There were three kind of parties or groups of leadership in um, the practice of the Jewish faith. There are Pharisees. Um, we know them probably best. Pharisees were responsible for maintaining the law, for teaching it correctly, uh, for the observance of Sabbath. Um, uh, some of the common things we would understand, they believed in the immortality of the soul. They also believed that there would be um, divine punishment uh, for uh, uncorrected or unresolved sin, unforgiven sin. The uh, Sadducees were the wealthier upper class most often because they were connected to the priestly tradition. So their life revolved around temple life, always. Um, and so the differences in their theology uh, were this. They completely rejected the oral law. They only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament as their poor choice of words, but as their gospel, as their truth. Um, their lives revolved, as I said, around the temple. Um, and so they, in refusing to go beyond those first five books of the Bible, they began to deny the immortality of the soul. There's not going to be a bodily resurrection after death. We don't believe in angelic spirits. There's another body uh, within the Jewish tradition, and they fall kind of somewhere in between, really. Um, the Essenes were, um, like the Sadducees, denied resurrection uh, after uh, death, wouldn't immerse themselves in public life. Now do you see kind of like their connection to the life of a monk? Uh, we kind of pull away from public life so that we can um, encourage one another, that we can be pure in the faith. However, they were more like the Pharisees in that they were devoted to meticulous observance of the Mosaic Law, uh, the observance especially of the Sabbath. 
Uh, so you've got those three groups. It's the Sadducees who are taught beyond belief about the power of these apostles. Remember, you got a wealthy ruling class. That meant they had more education. They had more uh, legs up. Uh, in their uh, work life and in their public life. These apostles, they used to be fishermen. They used to be, you name it, blue collar workers. There are all kinds of levels of conflict here. But the apostles are arrested by the Sadducees and an angel set them free in the middle of the night. Told them, you go to the temple courts and you keep preaching. At daybreak, they did exactly that. What, what? You've got these people we just arrested yesterday. How'd they get out? They're preaching in the temple. Again, the Sanhedrin, remember? We've met them several times now. The Sanhedrin is pulled together and they are steamed. They're um, listening to what's going on, not really sure uh, how to handle this. And Gamaliel... You're going to hear his name uh, later as it relates to Paul. But Gamaliel uh, sends them out of the room so they can't hear the conversation, the apostles. He sends them out of the room, and what he says to them is this. It makes so much sense. And uh, actually, his peers are listening this time. He says, basically, uh, listen, don't worry about all of this. If it's of human origin, I mean, if this is something they're concocting, it's going to fail. But if it's of God, it doesn't matter who brings it in here, it's not going to fail. So just let it go. Don't get so worked up about it. Don't worry about how people are hearing it. Don't worry about your own power or your ability to broker power. Don't, don't worry about it. It's going to be all be okay. So to kind of split the difference... Before they released them, not able to find anything wrong, um, before they released them, they had them flogged. Don't forget that, my friends. Now, you've got apostles, all except for Matthias, who are now living into the same kind of treatment that Jesus got. Not just the arrest, but being beaten and flogged like this. Uh, after that, um, we're going to have to obey God instead of listening uh, to men. And so basically they told them, uh, there's going to be more of this. See you later, alligator. We'll meet again. But they realized too, the, the apostles did, that there is now with the increase in numbers and having to deal with incarcerations and time before the Sanhedrin, which is probably going to happen again. We've got to find extra help. We've got to enlist or um, consecrate extra help. And so now is born the diakonia. That's a Greek word, which really means, just like it was translated in the chronological Bible, as waiting on table. Taking care of the basic needs, making sure everybody has a seat at the table, that you've got bread daily bread for your life. Every life is important uh, to God. And so these seven were chosen, Stephen and Philip, not the Philip uh, who would be an apostle, but Philip, another Philip, uh, is chosen as one of the seven to kind of arrange that. Now you're in charge of community ministry. That's the way it's supposed to work in the church, my friends. For those of you who have already given such a large part of your life to the ministry of the local church and beyond, thank you. Thank you for being willing to not count the cost as one too high. That you would be a part of encouraging the body. Those of you who are sitting on your laurels, scared to use your gifts, we're praying for you. <laughs> and those of you who are tempted because of your fatigue to say, I've done that before, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, don't wear it, can't wear it. Well, there's no retirement in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know what else to tell you. And so maybe it's time for you to find other work to do uh, because there is more than plenty, more than plenty. 
Um, so, sorry, I didn't mean to go to preaching there. Stephen is um, uh, particularly good at this, and he shows himself to be full of power, the power of the Holy Spirit, not of Stephen. Uh, he's full of the power of the Holy Spirit. He does wonders and all of this stuff. And somebody lies on him. Let me tell you who lies on him. There's a synagogue in the area um, that is the synagogue of the freedmen. They were Jews who were once enslaved to other Jews, to other folks who lived in the community um, because they were paying off debt or paying off family debt. Um, and they were once enslaved, now they're freed. I don't know what that means about why uh, power is still at issue, but they lie on Stephen, which means he ends up before religious leaders as well. And not only have they wanted to put the apostles to death, but now they've got other leaders that they can pick on, and that's exactly what they do. They tried to best him in debate, and they couldn't. And so they began to stir up uh, the people first, and then leadership towards Stephen uh, as another attack. But when he's a, before the Sanhedrin, and they ask him to make a response to the accusations, it's noted that his face looked like that of an angel. Remember? that the Sadducees, the Essenes, who would not have been a part of this picture, and the Pharisees didn't always agree on their theology. Mm -hmm. Stephen begins to recount with that angelic posture uh, the history of his people. Because what he wants to do is to answer the charges that he had not been respectful, he had been disrespectful, disrespectful of the Mosaic law and against God. And then he ends with this paragraph that basically says to those who are listening, all the leadership of the Jewish faith in that area, just like your fathers. That's exactly what you are, just like your fathers. You don't listen, so you can't believe. You won't believe even when you do listen. And your response, instead of uh, repentance and growing in your love and understanding of God, is you'd rather kill the messenger. Well, that is not the way to um, make friends my friends. And so they responded to Stephen in the same way you would guess that they did. And as they are about to grab him to punish him, probably flogging or some of those other choices, lesser choices, he says to them as he looks up, I see heaven open and I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now they are beyond, I mean, seeing stars they are. Not Jesus in the presence of God, but they just see in stars because they're so mad. They covered their ears. They tore clothes. They were yelling at the top of their voices. They dragged Stephen outside the city because you don't do this inside the city or you sin yourself. And they stone him. They pick up rocks big enough to crush your skull and they heave them at Stephen until he is dead. That's hard work. That's hard work. And so they took off their outer tunics as they worked so hard. Their tunics were left at the feet of a young Pharisee by the name of Saul who approved of Stephen's death. Do you see what's coming, my friends? Do you see? Saul begins to grow in respect, but also in an angry boldness of defending the Jewish faith. Um, and I don't know the better phrase. That's not really the right phrase, but he, he is the defender now. And he uh, sets out to destroy the church. Uh, 
I just want to remind you again, Jesus never intended, I don't think, to create a new religion. It was to look at one that was often empty of power and to connect again with God in a powerful way. Meaning that God would share his power with those who submitted themselves to him. He wasn't about labeling us. We all about labels. So here's Paul, Saul rather, right now, breathing murderous threats, soliciting letters from the temple, from the Sanhedrin, so that he has the right to be able to go house to house, dragging believers out, incarcerating men and women, leaving children with no parents, so that this entity would die. And it happens one day he is on his way to Damascus with those same letters, those same intents, and he runs right into Jesus. You know the story. In chapter 9 of the book of Acts, he's walking on the road with his attendants. Everybody sees the flash. I told our Bible study group not too long ago that it makes me think of that scene in uh, Men in Black when um, the Will Smith character experiences that little flashlight thing for the I, I mean it 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 shakes them but it doesn't have the same effect on Paul's attend Saul's attendance that it does on Saul it blinds him Saul Saul why do you persecute me Lord who are you he has no idea that it is Jesus can you imagine how it changed this man's everything, the way he thought about Jesus, the way he considered how he'd been trained and taught to believe. Now he's dealing with a blindness that is will eventually be resolved, but it's not resolved now. He has to be led by the hand along a dusty road with stones and pebbles, little bitty obstacles in the way that now trip him up as he gets to this place in Damascus. I love this story so much, though. There's another Ananias, not the same. Remember, he kicked the bucket. Uh, there's an Ananias there who is a devout believer in Jesus. And Jesus calls to him and says, hey, okay, so this is the deal. There's this guy, and he's at this house, and I want you to go there and let him know that I've sent you to heal his blindness. And when he reveals his name... Ananias basically says to Jesus, uh, you do know that he's looking to kill people like me, right? And Jesus' response is, go, go. My friends, don't let that be lost on you, that that is the admonition of Jesus for each one of his disciples. Go, go. Why are you so afraid? Go. I am in the middle of this. And so he did. And this is my favorite part of the story. He walks into the house where Saul is blinded, reeling emotionally, mentally, spiritually. All kinds of shifts happening for him. We don't know what happened to all of his attendants. We don't know if they were converted to. We don't know. But we do know this, Ananias, a devout follower of Jesus, trusting in the call of Christ and in the power within him because of Christ, he walks into that house, he lays his hands on this man who the day before wanted to kill him, and he called him brother. He welcomed Saul into the fold. He referred to him as family because he trusted in what Jesus was doing. He trusted in what Jesus was doing. Ananias did what you and I are called to do with every one of our neighbors. We use other words besides brother and sister more often than not. 
So I, this is the challenge that I'm accepting from Scripture today. Who is it that really is my brother or my sister and I have treated otherwise? Maybe that's where we begin, my friends. Living into a new kind of power, not our own, but God's. Just look what Paul wants Saul will begin to do by and because of Jesus. I'm not comparing myself to Saul or Paul, but whew, where is the conversion in my life? Power used in one direction or sought in one direction and now used or found in another? Ooh. I hope you'll join me in considering who it is that I need to love better today because they are my brother and my sister. Let's pray together. Lord, I am so grateful for the Ananiases in our lives, those who've been willing to meet us where we are uh, in our transition, in our confusion, in our frustration, in our just short of healing state. Oh, those who've laid hands on us and prayed over us, those who've encouraged us and answered questions, those who have walked alongside us, those who have been willing to call us brother or sister. When we have acted otherwise, I thank you for those Ananiases in our lives. And I thank you, Lord, that you understand that when we try to be Ananias, our first response sometimes is, Lord, you do know what you're asking of us, right? That this is, I don't understand how this is gonna go well. You understand that, yet you don't back down, go. You tell us to go, and not only to go, but to go boldly, go confidently. Go peacefully, go peaceably, go, go. We have not gone to many with peace and love and connection as our intent, as our goal, because we often forget who and whose we are. Forgive us, God. Forgive us and give us another chance. Show us today, Lord, as we spend time listening to you. Show us who it is that we can love better. We can love like a brother and love like a sister. And watch what you will do in us individually, in us and together, uh, in us together, uh, through us individually and together. Oh, show us how to be an Ananias to one in whom you have already begun a big work. May we remember we are in this together, this life of faith, and today we are grateful again for those who have been an Ananias to us and for the chance to be that alongside someone that you love dearly. Help us love them that way too. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. My friends, good to be with you again on this beautiful day. Blessings on all that you do. See you soon.